Welcome to Friday Q&A, where we go over all of your eye health, eye surgery, eye makeup health, and kids' vision questions every week. Hey everyone, I am Dr. Rupa Wong, board certified ophthalmologist, and today we're answering your eye health questions head over to the community tab and drop your questions there. I'll be answering your questions so we can all learn about eye health and vision together. All right, let's get to the first question. Excellent presentation, so informative, thank you. Well, thank you, Marietta, that's really sweet of you. I heard you say you frequently do blepharoplasty on both eyes at the same surgery, which should promote symmetry. Is it a preferred or possible procedure to remove protruding lower lid fat pads at the same time? If both lids of both eyes are operated on during one surgery, does this impact the recovery period or increase potential complications such as eyes no longer closing completely or other issues? Well, that's an excellent question, Marietta. And yes, we always do both upper lids at the same time. And you can have a lower lid blepharoplasty done at the exact same time as well. Many of us have fat that is protruding that happens as the mid face starts to sag and droop and you lose the muscular support in the mid face, which keeps the fat pads typically in check. So it's really common to do the uppers and lowers at the same time. The only issue is if you are doing your upper lid blepharoplasty for a functional reason because it's obstructing your superior visual field and it's covered by medical insurance, sometimes certain insurances don't like that to be combined with the lower lid blepharoplasty because that's a cash pay procedure. There's never a medical indication, unfortunately, for removing the excess skin and fat of the lower eyelids. But let's talk about complications. With an upper eyelid blepharoplasty, we worry about taking too much skin and inability to close the eyes, as Marietta rightly pointed out. In the lower lids, we're a little more concerned about uncontrolled bleeding. There are some significant uh, blood vessels in the lower lid region. There are two different approaches that you can have for a lower lid blepharoplasty. One is through the skin. So if you have a lot of skin creeping and extra skin, if you're a little bit older, um, and sometimes it's not even if you're older, if you just have that extra skin, they may choose to do a skin incision so they can remove the extra skin as well as taking the fat pad. But a really nice thing is they can actually do a lower lid blepharoplasty transconjunctivally, which means through the conjunctiva right there. And so that way there is no skin incision. Of course, for me as an eye muscle surgeon, that's my primary subspecialty, the inferior oblique muscle that runs right between the fat pads of the lower lid. So it's really possible for uh, surgeons to damage that inferior oblique muscle, especially if they're not really well trained in the eye anatomy. I would surely hope that you're going to someone that is trained in the eye anatomy, but there are a lot of surgeons that do this. It's not just ophthalmologists like myself, facial plastic surgeons who of course are very well trained and even general plastic surgeons will do this procedure. So damaging the inferior oblique muscle is a possibility which would result in double vision and your eye being stuck down. I know that sounds terrible. The other thing is uncontrolled bleeding. So you can get some really serious consequences called a retrobulbar hemorrhage, which can actually cause blindness. It can happen in the upper lids if you do an upper bluff, but it can also happen in the lower lids. And then last, if there is skin being taken, there is always a risk, and especially a little bit more so with the lower lids, of getting an entropion or an ectropion. An entropion is when the lower lid is going to be rotating in, when the eyelid is malpositioned and is rotated in. An ectropion is when it's malpositioned and rotated out. And those are basically worst case scenarios. It doesn't happen more with the lowers if you're combining it with the uppers, but those are just some of the complications of the lowers. All right, so let's head on to question number two. Hi, Dr. Rupa, I've been waiting for you to post a video. I know, sorry, I took a little break for a while. I needed to just regroup. What do you think of atropine sulfate ophthalmologist solution for teens? Do they really work? Is it safe? So I clarified with this commenter that she was talking about low dose atropine, either atropine 0.01% all the way up to 0.05%. Low dose atropine is a treatment for kids ages four to about 12, and actually can use it for kids that are older, um, even in their teen years, 
to slow the progression of nearsightedness. It's really pretty amazing. They did some initial studies back in about 2010 in Singapore, and since then it's been replicated in a lot of different studies. The initial study was called the Atropine Treatment of Myopia Trial, ADAM, and since then they've done ADAM2 and ADAM3, looking at the various dosages of low-dose atropine. I have an entire video about this drop because I actually have all three of my children on it as a preventative measure, which is a little bit off-label. I mean, the drop itself is not FDA approved for this purpose, so this is going to be a discussion you have with your pediatric ophthalmologist. It's very, very limited side effects, so for me, it was worth it to started in my children because my husband is extremely nearsighted and I didn't want my kids to have the vision threatening complications of retinal detachments and things that he has a lot of in his family. So yes, it is safe, very minimal side effects, typically just some eye redness or pupil dilation. Some might complain of bright lights or inability to read up close and if that happens then I just drop the concentration of the atropine down. But if you want to look at any of the original studies, I actually have them all posted on my Honolulu Eye Clinic practice website because I do so much of this. It's called myopia management. So I'm going to post that in the show notes so that way you can actually download the PDFs if you want to take a look at the ADAM2 studies. A new study came out talking about you need to use a stronger dose of the drop, 0.05% in younger kids as compared to older kids. There's a lot of information out there, a lot of great, great studies. Something I do a ton of in my practice, I have about 200 patients I've treated with low dose atropine in my practice, and I think it is very effective. It's a great treatment option. Now, a lot of the studies looked at kids ages four to about 13. You can use it all the way up until age 18 because we still see a lot of growth and elongation of the eye until that point. So just talk with your pediatric ophthalmologist about that or your optometrist uh, to judge and see what's right for you and your child. Thanks for that question. All right, Ligia asks, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Hi, I love makeup. So do I, as you know, especially eye makeup. But lately I've been having reactions and my eyelids get puffy and very, very dry and flaky. Could you recommend something over the counter that I can use on my eyelids, please? Thanks. All right, so this is a really common thing and I think probably deserves an entire video unto itself, especially with winter. Everybody's skin gets really dry and inflamed. So here's the thing, there's a lot of different reasons your eyelid skin can be dry and flaky or dermatitis. And in this big study that they had done a couple of years ago, they, they looked at 203 patients. And then what they did was they did like the patch test and the prick test, and they really checked to see what people were allergic to. And they found that 74% had some kind of allergic contact dermatitis. So what does that mean? Well, you can be allergic to so many things. You can be allergic to cosmetics, to eye drops, topical medications, any ointment you're putting in or around the eye, um, metals. Unfortunately, artificial nails are a big one and can cause a lot of eyelid skin reactions, as well as just your typical dust mites and animal dander, unfortunately. Here at Hawaii, lots of cockroaches. I hate to say it, but that's the price of living out here. So if this is something long-standing, I do recommend that you see your dermatologist or your ophthalmologist to figure it out and make sure that it's not something that needs to be eliminated. You know, maybe uh, you need to eliminate a, those certain cosmetics and you can have a reaction to cosmetics even if you've used it for months and months or years, you can develop an allergic dermatitis to something. So you might want to just stop by discontinuing all of your cosmetics to see if the skin just improves on its own. But something to just ease the dryness and the flaking, there's two over-the-counter products that I really like. You can use um, CeraVe. They actually have an eye cream. So you don't wanna just use the CeraVe like moisture lotion. You wanna use something that's specially formulated for the eyes. So I really like that. It's very nice and hydrating. My skin's just dry in general. So that's a really good one that's available over the counter. Doesn't need a prescription, it's relatively inexpensive. And then Aquaphor, which if you have eczema at all, you know this is a great one too. Um, Aquaphor has an ointment that you can use at bedtime. 
And those are great because those options are non-steroidal. You know, if you go to see your dermatologist or ophthalmologist and they assess that you actually need a steroid, they'll give you a mild steroid. But please don't go and buy yourself hydrocortisone cream at the drugstore. That is too strong of a steroid to be using on your eyelid skin, which is already the thinnest skin in your body. And it can actually thin your skin even more. And that's not something that you want. Well, thanks so much for joining me today on our Friday Q&A. Just a reminder, hop on over to that community tab and put your questions down there in the comment section so that I can get to them week by week. And I would really love it if you could subscribe to the channel so that we can continue empowering everybody to know a little bit more about their vision and their eye health. Until next time, I'm Dr. Rupa. It's good to see you.